Hi, this is Pastor Christy and Pastor Dave from Trinity Lutheran Church in West Bend, I'm inviting you to share with us our worship for the weekend of August 8th and 9th. We have a number of thoughts for the day for today. The first comes from the book of Isaiah, where the prophet writes, But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. The next is a quote from an unknown source that goes, In the midst of the storm, God is working. God is healing, God is cleansing, God is protecting, God is loving, God is delivering. From Scott Crepain we read, Sometimes God calms the storm with a whispered, Peace be still. God can settle any sea, but that doesn't mean God will. Sometimes God holds us close and lets the wind and waves go wild. Sometimes God calms the storm. And other times, God calms God's child. And finally, from Hirokuru Murakami. Once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure, in fact, whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain. When you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. That's what this storm's all about. Let's make a tiny little world and call it God's world. Where people don't bully and our hearts are true and kind. Let's make a tiny little house and call it Home House, where people aren't greedy and we leave our fears behind. A little bit of light in a world full of night. A little bit of warmth in a world full of storm. A picture of the world we really want to see. God is planting hope around this world with people like you and me. we can understand each other where anger and prejudice can never rule the day a little bit of light in a world full of night a little bit of war in a world full of storm a picture of the world God is planting hope around this world with people like you and me. Let's build a place where the door is always open, where friendship is simply what we do. Let's build a place where we learn the art of loving. We love our friends and neighbors and love the stranger too. A little bit of light in a world full of night. A little bit of warmth in a world full of storm. A picture of the world, we 
really want to see. God is planting hope around this world with people like you and me. A little bit of light in a world full of night. A little bit of warmth in a world full of storm. A picture of the world we really want to see. God is planting hope around this world with people like you and me. We gather together with our call to worship. Scripture tells us of how Jesus once invited Peter to step out in faith onto the deep waters. We are also invited to step out of our safety and security and walk toward Jesus. Peter became afraid and in his fear began to sink. Like Peter, we see the raging storms of life. We are afraid and cry out, Lord, save us. The one who has power over all creation comes to save us. In the midst of the storms, we are saved by Jesus. God alone deserves our loyalty and trust, but often our faith sinks. Our trust is blown away by the storms of life. Let us tell God of our sins that we might know forgiveness and live forever with our God. Join me as we pray, saying, Too Too often often waiting waiting God. We We have have so so little little faith that that we we begin begin to sink, sink. and And we we trust trust the world to save us. We We find it so easy to be drawn into the temptations of the world. Our boats boats seem seem so sturdy and safe that that we hesitate hesitate to step out of them into into new ways of life. Save us, holy God. Save us. Reach out your hand to those dying in fear and drowning in doubt and hopelessness. And hopelessness. Reach out your hand, as Jesus did to Peter, not because we deserve rescue, but because you love us enough to save us from ourselves, from our sin, and from death. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We cannot avoid the truth that we are sinners. But the greater truth is that we are forgiven sinners. Through God's love in Christ Jesus, we set aside all that is past and step out in courage and faith into God's future for us. We We trust trust God's God's promises. promises. We We trust trust Christ's Christ's resurrection. resurrection. We We trust trust the Spirit who works in and through us. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side with love and strength for each new day.
lesson this weekend comes from the 14th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, and we read it from the message this week. As soon as the meal was finished, Jesus insisted that the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the people. With the crowd dispersed, he climbed the mountain so that he could be by himself and pray. He stayed there alone, late into the night. Meanwhile, the boat was far out to sea when the wind came up against them and they were battered by the waves. At about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. They were scared out of their wits. A ghost, they cried out in terror. But Jesus was quick to comfort them. Courage, it's me. Don't be afraid. Peter suddenly bold said, Master, if it's really you, call me to come to you on the water. He said, come ahead. Jumping out of the boat, Peter walked on the water to Jesus, but when he looked down at the waves churning beneath his feet, he lost his nerve and started to sink. He cried, Master, save me! Jesus didn't hesitate. He reached down and grabbed his hand. Then he said, Faint heart, what got into you? The two of them climbed into the boat and the wind died down. The disciples in the boat, having watched the whole thing, worshipped Jesus, saying, This is it. You are God's son for sure. Here ends our reading. Grace, mercy, and peace to each of you. From God, our Father and Creator, from Christ, our Lord and Savior, and from the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us and calls us to become the children of God, the siblings in Christ that we are called to be. Amen. This week... I know the story is very familiar. Peter walking on the water. It's been the subject of paintings in more of the churches I've visited and served at over the years than almost any other picture. It resonates with us because we see ourselves in it. And that's important. Hang on to that. We'll talk about it more because that invites us into a problem that speaks to us today. The problem of how do we, as children of God, maintain our focus and our movement through life on following Jesus instead of all the turmoil around us. And that's exactly what this story is written for, to address that same concern. I'd like to start with an image It's an image that I find helpful when we're talking about the importance of focus. When I was learning to drive, I was not what you would call a natural. (laughs) I, I was very, very big on not wanting to do any harm. And so I spent a lot of time, you know, doing what I thought they were telling me. Look very carefully. Be sure that you're not going to hit anything. You're not going to do anything wrong. And so I would look over the steering wheel, over the front of the car, and, and try to see what was right in front of me so I would be sure that things were fine. I don't know if you've ever driven that way. (laughs) But when you do, there's a lot of twisting and turning and then eventually missing like the big direction of the big turns or the sharp turns, because you're not looking far enough in the distance. One of the families that I babysat for, their mom helped me practice. She had me drive home one day, and she gave me the message that I think we need to keep as we listen to this story. She said, stop looking right in front of you. Look out, look out ahead, and then you'll find you're going much straighter, and you'll know where the big turns are, you'll be fine. The little stuff along the side, you'll be able to navigate around, but keep your focus where where you want to go. And so, as we dive into the story, that's where I want us to remember. This is a story that calls us to keep our focus on Jesus, on following Jesus, not on every little thing that's all around us along the way. And so here we go. (laughs) This this story today, I said it, it speaks to us all. It talks about that concept of fear versus faith. You know, do you look to where you're going or are you so afraid of every little thing jumping up too close that 
you can't see where you're going. And the Bible offers us some images that are very strong on this matter. The first image is the idea of the storm and the water itself. In the first couple chapters of Genesis, the first thing that God does when God creates the world is to put the waters in its place, to tame the chaos and, and put things where they belong. And you'll notice that's all in there. Darkness and light. The water was a huge symbol of chaos and fear, and God separated and pushed it back and contained it into places because the Bible wants us to be clear that God is the God of creation, that God is still ultimately in charge. So that's, that's point number one. <laughs> point number two is from the gospel story of Matthew itself. A couple things that maybe you know, maybe you haven't noticed before. First of all, this story of Jesus walking on the water and calling Peter out, this is the second time in the gospel of Matthew that Jesus basically calms a storm. The first time is in the eighth chapter, where Jesus is with the disciples in the boat, and he's asleep. And the disciples, the storm comes up, and the disciples panic, and Jesus kind of wakes up. They, you know, they're shaking him, going, do something, save us. And he says, all right, you know, don't be afraid. Calm down. And he stands up, and he calms the storm. And after that, the disciples say, Wow, you know, they are amazed because they have seen this miracle. And now Jesus has calmed the storm. So they are in awe of Jesus' power. But they still really don't get it. Which is why when our story occurs in chapter 14, things are similar but different. First of all, it follows directly on Jesus feeding the 5,000. That big scene where the disciples have once again seen evidence of Jesus' power through God to change the world, to make things happen. Interestingly enough, after this, and it's been a busy day and we hear they're exhausted, Jesus insisted that they immediately get into the boat and go on to the next place. And Jesus says, I'll catch up with you. And the Bible tells us Jesus went off by himself and prayed. Well, then we catch up with the disciples in their little boat, and it's dark. And the storm brews up, and all of a sudden, they see Jesus. Now, two things, two things to notice. One that I never paid attention to before. When they first see Jesus, they're more terrified of Jesus than they are of the water around him. They think it's a ghost. They've been fishermen most of them, that most of their lives they've been through storms. They're terrifying, but the ghost was even more scary. So first there's that. Then secondly, we have them finally recognizing that it's Jesus, having Peter ask to follow, and then he walks out onto the water. And he does walk out a couple steps. But, you know, he does what's considered impossible for a second or two, and then he goes down. But he cries out, and again, immediately, Jesus reaches out to pull him up. Now, I hope you caught the inflection of the message's version of this story. Because in the past, I think I've heard people look read it so that like when God or when Jesus looks at Peter, how could you have so little faith? You know, what's the matter with you? But it's really a much more compassionate. Jesus reaches out, pulls him up. They walk back to the boat. The storm is calmed. And they said, it's all right. You know, where's your faith? Where's your trust? God is with you. I'm here. That's huge. <laughs> and uh, if you look carefully, at this point, this is where the one story changes from the other. This time, the disciples kind of get the lesson. 
Instead of saying they were amazed by God's power, they said, look at what Jesus did. Surely this is God at work. Little glimmer. They kind of get it. But it's important. In this story of the question of fear and faith and how we respond to it, we need to recognize those differences. One other thing you may not have picked up because of the translation we read, in many translations, what Jesus says to Peter is, and to the disciples is, fear not, it's me, as he's walking across the water. And unless you read the Gospel of Matthew as a whole, or all the Gospels as a chunk, you might not notice. But especially in Matthew and in Luke, you hear over and over again, fear not, don't be afraid. The angels say it, right? On the day Jesus is born, right? They show up, fear not, for we have, you know, glad tidings of great joy. Jesus, throughout his ministry, tells people, fear not. And then finally, even after his resurrection, and as he appears to the disciples, and as he appears to the women, the first words are, fear not. Do not be afraid. Fear is that big conflict with faith. I mean, fear is a great response. It really is. It keeps us safe from many, many things. It's a gift of God. But it also can be paralyzing and crippling. It can make us sink and drown as the image of Peter going down, surrounded by the things that frighten him. The scriptures use these words and they're organized carefully for us to catch that image because the real problem that the story is challenging us to address today is our, our, our fears preventing us from walking toward Jesus, from following the call of all of us who are called to be children of God. Jesus is the calmer of all fears, and Jesus calls us to trust. And so I guess we would probably agree, I, I can't imagine anyone not, that so far 2020 has been a time of great fear. <laughs> over and over again, it seems like, you know, one thing goes wrong, and then something else goes wrong, and then something else goes wrong again. You know, in, these past, in this past week, we've seen not only the COVID epidemic taking off as far as numbers and deaths, we have the unrest that's come from the fact that suddenly in the midst of this, a lot of the social inequities that have been something that many people have been able to look away from unless they were experiencing them are, are forced to face. Uh, on top of that, you have Hurricane Isaias going through. And then, of course, you have this huge explosion in Beirut. It's like, I'm afraid to turn on the news this week because it's going to be some other bad news. Something terrifying, not just frightening, terrifying. And yet it's to this very thing that God is speaking to us right now through this scripture. God is calling us to recognize that, recognize who we are. We're flawed. We are not in control of all the things we would like to be in control of. We're blind too often to the things that don't affect us directly. We've seen who we are, and it's not pleasant. But we are also children of God called and enabled to be so much more if we let the Spirit work through us. There's an invitation in this time in history. I don't remember who made the quote. I know I have it on my little refrigerator on a magnet. Um, but it reminds me of how real this story is. It makes the proclamation that 
We may all have gotten here differently, but we're all in the same boat now. (laughs) And that boat is the same boat as the disciples and Peter. A boat that's being tossed around by waves that we could not have imagined a year ago. And suddenly, here we are. We're in a time where we don't know what the answers are. As a matter of fact, no one seems to. But what we too often ignore is the fact that in the midst of these things that terrify us, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, is indeed still with us. And as we go through these storms, they may be new to us, but this is not the first time in the history of the people of God that the people of God have faced overwhelming, uncontrollable, terrifying situations. And somehow, God has managed to get them through. Not everyone. Too often we rely on the promise that no matter what happens in how all this comes down, we're always safe in God's hands. Ultimately, ultimately that's a comfort. But I know facing it, that's less comfortable. Uh, But it's not any less true. In the midst of these storms, we individually can find peace and comfort in knowing that God is with us and whatever happens at the outcome, God will be with us then too. We'll be fine. Now the other one, is a, the, other, the next thing is a little trickier because the story also reminds us that it's about more than us being safe and us being at peace in the midst of the storm. We have this whole instance now of Jesus approaching, of Peter going out to follow, to face the storms, to walk through the storms in order to be faithfully following Jesus. That gets a little bit harder because it hits us in a place that, you know, gosh, we would like to stay safe in that boat of God's love and to take it that next step that Peter is demonstrating for us, to actually walk out and try to make things different, that's tougher. But we can't let the storms around us become so fearful that we don't hear the call to not only survive what's going on, but to be a part of what's changing what's going on, a part of fixing the things that these problems, these storms are pointing out as problems that have been around forever. That's more scary. Remember, when the disciples first saw Jesus coming, they were terrified. They thought he was a ghost. He represented something to them that was even more terrifying than the waves. And I think as we're struggling through COVID and the natural disasters and everything else, I think people are especially even more terrified of the parts of our society that are calling us to to become something else, to help be a part of fixing broken and unequal systems. They seem more terrifying than the storms maybe itself, but that's another call that, that we are meant to hear. And so I invite us all, we're going to to think again. Here we are in the boat, tossed around by the storm. Is our response going to be being immobilized in terror? Is our response going to be to take a breath and just sit back and know that God is in control? Or are we going to be like Peter? And hear that call to be a part of using these times to make whatever comes next better. I believe that God's call is always to follow Jesus into trying to create a reflection on earth of God's dream for what it should be. I invite you to consider that as well. 
Amen. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you got my soul. You are Lord of the anger. When my sails are torn, your love surrounds me. In the eye of the storm. Falling out from underneath my feet Between the black skies and my red eyes I can barely see And when I'm feeling like I've been let down By my friends and family I can hear the rain reminding me In the eye of the storm You remain in control In the middle of the war far from me and I'm running out of faith I see the future I picture slowly fade away and when my tears of pain and heartache are pouring down my face I find my peace in Jesus name in the eye of the storm you remain in control don't know how I'm gonna make ends meet. I did my best, now I'm scared to death that we might lose everything. And when a sickness takes my child away and there's nothing I can do, my only hope is to trust you. I trust you, Lord, in the eye of the storm. You remain in control. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus.
and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us through these times so far. We thank you for the strength that you've given us. We thank you that we are still with you and we carry your promise that we will never have to face life's storms alone. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, you are the God of justice and truth. Lead us toward you from darkness into light. Lord, the pandemic has starkly revealed the economic, racial, and social inequalities of the status quo in so many countries in both hemispheres. This makes for poor physical, mental, and emotional health in all sections of the population and an increase in injustice and unstable communities. We have seen the people of color and the poor have borne the brunt of these crises, much higher rates of virus infection and death, as well as greater social economic devastations. Lord, be with our siblings who are struggling so much harder than we are as we mourn our own restrictions and problems and worries. Help us not forget those struggling so deeply all around us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, you created us all in your image. Open our eyes to see the beauty and diversity that you have created and celebrate our differences as well as our similarities. Together we make up a beautiful image reflecting you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, help us to embrace the new now and recognize that it has to be different from the old normal if we want our children to have a future on this world we call home. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for the generosity and welcome of those individuals daring to step up and stand out from the crowd in order to share your love and your welcoming heart in these stormy times. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, help us walk toward Jesus. Help us walk toward lives that reflect your love, your compassion, your nonviolence, your equality. And help us choose to dedicate our lives to creating cultures of peace and justice and healing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, this week, please be with all those who are suffering whether it's those who have, whose lives have been devastated by Hurricane Isaias, whether it is those who are facing joblessness and devastations of businesses and lives and future hopes, whether it's those who have experienced the loss of loved ones in this past week. Lord, we are in a world where we are all too aware of suffering, not only our own, but of those of the people around us. Lord, please assure us of your love. Let us lean on your strength and help those with the peace and strength of your love who need it the most. Lord, we remember all the nameless people whose lives we don't know or understand. And we also recognize before you those whose names we do know. Chuck, Eleanor, Betty, Tom, Carrie, Kelsey, Eileen, Ruth, Evelyn, Catherine, Jacob, Christine, Linda, Calvin, Mike, Brian, Dorothy, Margie, Heidi, Andrea, Karen, Mick, Val. Lord, we also remember those who lost their lives in the horrible explosion in Beirut. Be with their families as they suffer this sudden and terrifying time. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy thy name. name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come. come. Thy Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And and forgive us our trespasses as as we forgive forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are sent forth from this place to be light, hope, and strength to others, that others may know that there is indeed a way through the storms of life to a safe haven and a peace grounded in the assurance of God's love. May we forget ourselves long enough and thoroughly enough to be this kind of witness to our neighbor, always and ever in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. With love and strength for each new day, he will make